for quite a while I have wanted to make a series of short tapes which in my head I've always thought of as the legacy of Steve DeShazer. I do think that Steve and the Milwaukee Brief Family Therapy Centre team's work has been transformative in many fields. And uh, Steve DeShazer became very much our mentor at Brief. That's Chris Harvey, Chris Iveson, Harvey Ratner, and myself became very much our mentor. And I've wanted to make a series of short videos setting out some aspects of his legacy. And this is the first one. So in 1985, Steve DeShazer published his second book, which was his first truly solution-focused book, or well, almost solution-focused book in some ways. And he called the book Keys to Solution in Brief Therapy. And there's in that book, there's just a sentence that always makes me smile when I read it. And Steve wrote, as I watched other brief therapists work, I became more and more convinced that clients really do want to change. As I watched other brief therapists work, I became more and more convinced that clients really do want to change. And when I read this and think about it, it connects back to something that Steve wrote in his earlier book, Patterns, the book that really is pre-solution focus. And in that book, he wrote this, from the earliest days, 20th century psychotherapy has most often been described as a contest. The contest was this, the therapist for change had joined battle against the client's resistance, a force against change. Once the therapist won this context, the client was no longer seen as resistant and there was a cure. The problem was solved. So in 1985, Steve writes that he has become really convinced, more and more convinced, that clients really do want to change. And this, I think, these two comments together point us to a prevailing suspicion perhaps in the psychotherapy world that has been influential a suspicion that clients don't really mean what they're saying they don't really mean what they're telling us they're saying one thing but they're meaning another and of course this idea fits with all of the ideas of the unconscious. The idea actually that clients can't at some level know what they really, listen to that word, really mean, and that actually it is professionals. People like many of us who are trained, trained to know what clients really mean and to interpret that real meaning for clients one way or another. We are the experts. We know what is really happening. That was the predominant, I think, idea. So what we had, I think, the background against which Steve DeShazer's writing can be seen to contrast, what we had was a body of theory that called into doubt the question of whether clients really wanted to change. And part of that background of thinking 
not calling into doubt, but part of the background against which the doubt formed, that might be a better way to put it, was the idea of homeostasis, the idea of balanced systems, and the idea that actually the symptom, the problem, might be playing a part, or probably was playing a part, in maintaining the stability of the system. And in this sense, I guess, problems, symptoms, could be seen as systemically functional, if we go back to those early days of systemic thinking. So that was one little theory that sort of questioned the idea that clients really want to change. Clients might want change, but the system demanded stability. Look, another word that we often hear, we can sit in conferences and often hear people talking about the idea of ambivalence. The idea that perhaps on the one hand, the client does want change, on the other hand, the client doesn't want change. The client's ambivalent about change. And of course that relates to the idea of secondary gain, the idea that again problem behavior one way or another is useful to the client. It's actually useful to the client. It relates back to the idea of resistance. The idea that somehow the problem might be helpful to the client in managing their anxiety, whatever it is, but somehow the problem is useful to them. So homeostasis, ambivalence, secondary gain, and then, you know, at a slightly cruder, less theoretical level, perhaps, we often hear people talking about the idea that the clients in their comfort zone, that actually therefore change is hard and people don't want to, slightly negative and critical view of people perhaps, but people don't want to work hard to come out of their comfort zone. They prefer being in a potentially unpleasant place that's familiar to putting in all the hard work to change it. And this, of course, all of this meant that actually people had to be got somehow to commit to change. We started having the idea that people had to commit to action plans. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And writing down, what are they going to do? And that, of course, makes complete sense committing people to action, action plans, writing it down, if we don't quite take the client's wish to change seriously. Sure, they're saying it, but do they really mean it? I don't think so. So somehow they're going to have to write down what they're going to have to do as a commitment to change. But as soon as we start believing the client, I became more and more convinced that clients really do want to change. Everything changes. Whatever the client does now is read as their best attempt to cooperate. So it's not my job to try and get them to do things. It's my job to collaborate and cooperate with the client in their best efforts, to get alongside them in their best efforts. If the client doesn't do something that they said they might do, then they must have had a good reason for that. How come they made the decision not to? And what else did they do? that was more useful to them in some way. So the fundamental underpinnings, I think, of the interaction, of the relationship between client and worker 
change when we become more and more convinced that clients really do want to change. So there we are. That's the first of these um, a series of short videos. They're going to be picking up little elements of Steve DeShazer's thinking and writing and considering the impact that those have made both on the field of psychotherapy and for clients, service users, coaches, and indeed for all of us at Brief. Thank you for listening.